All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Crossroads. It's good to see you all here. We're glad you come to worship with us, and uh, we'll have a great time of worship as always. Uh, so that's uh, no better time than the present to get started. Make yourselves at home, of course, and, and uh, relax and, uh, and stand, too. If you're able to stand, stand with us as we sing. Declaring the word of the Lord And these are the days of your servant Moses Righteousness being restored And though these are days of great trials Of famine and darkness and sword Still we are the voice in the desert the clouds shining like the sun at the trumpet call so lift your voice it's the year of jubilee and out of zion's hill salvation comes these are the days of ezekiel the dry bones becoming as flesh and these are the days of your servant david rebuilding a temple of praise and these are the days of the harvest the fields are as white in the world and we are the laborers in your vineyard declaring the word of the lord behold he comes riding on the clouds shining like the sun trumpet calls so lift your voice it's the year of jubilee and out of science hill salvation comes behold he comes riding on the clouds shining like the sun at the trumpet call so lift your voice it's the year of jubilee and out of science hill salvation comes there's no God like Jehovah. 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 Behold, He comes riding on the clouds, shining like the sun at the trumpet calls. Lift your voice. And out of science till salvation comes Behold he comes Riding on the clouds Shining like the sun At the trumpet call So lift your voice It's the year of jubilee And out of science till salvation comes Amen, you may be seated In John 13, 34, Jesus says, Love one another as I have loved you. This verse is at the center of Stephen's ministry, that we are to love one another as Christ loves us. Stephen's ministry provides confidential one-on-one -on -one care to individuals who are experiencing a tough season in their lives. Trained caregivers come alongside men and women to listen, encourage, support, and pray for them as they seek healing and strength in the midst of the challenges they face. A great number of our people in our churches and in our pews are hurting day by day and week by week. I think it's critical as a church that even as we're gathering people and loving each other on Sundays and through our small groups, that we address and care for and love people as they're going through the darkest, hardest seasons of their life. I really like the idea of you know, God working through me to help others. That's the whole point of Stephen's ministry is that we care, God heals. Coming alongside someone in crisis is one of the most important things we can do as a church. 
and one of the tangible ways we live into Jesus' calling to love as he first loved us. With all of the busyness and distractions in our world today, perhaps now more than ever, we need people who are willing to consistently show up, sit with, listen to, and encourage those who need it most. I think I'd seen so much transformation in my own life from having one-on-one -on -one care. I was just kind of automatically drawn to the possibility of Stephen ministry. Everyone can do that. That's the beauty of it. Everyone has the tools. It's Christ-like caring, but at the end of the day, it's just listening. Over the years, we have heard countless stories of men and women who have rediscovered hope, peace, and purpose while meeting with their Stephen minister. Being a caregiver is an incredible opportunity to demonstrate the love of Christ in transformative ways as we seek to be the church together. Good morning. My name is Vicki Schaefer. This is Michelle Koval, Kathy Miller, and we're Stephen Leaders. We're just regular, ordinary members of Crossroads Bible Church who have chosen to um, serve the King and His Kingdom through Stephen Ministry. Stephen Ministry is Christ caring for people through people. And we as Stephen ministers help others feel valued, cared for, and understood. Today in your bulletin, you received um, contact information and information about Stephen ministry. We have a training coming up. And if you're interested, we would love to talk with you more about it. If you have questions, please see us. This could be the ministry for you. People are drawn to Stephen ministry training by the desire to make a difference during a time of need in someone's life. What often surprises them is the great personal and spiritual growth they themselves experience. If you're interested in finding out about training to be a Stephen minister, sign up at Crossroads Connection Table. It's out in the lobby right through those doors. All right, thank you, Vicki, Kathy, and Michelle. Um, Spring Live Youth Outreach. We have a special event Saturday, April 27th, okay? Starting at noon until 8 p.m. Uh, for 6th through 12th grade students. I'm going to have uh, a team from Word of Life Bible Institute. We're going bowling, we're going ice skating, we're doing uh, archery tag, a whole lot of fun, and it's an outreach. So invite your friends. Um, see me for more information. Uh, also, our 20th annual pro-life dinner will be held at Penwood Bible Church on Friday, April 26th. Dinner will be at 6 p.m. Doors open at 5 p.m. Come for an evening of good food and fellowship celebrating life. Adults $20, students $15. You can see me or uh, uh, there's uh, an RSVP to Pam Lucas, and I can connect you with that information if you're interested. Uh, the Crossroads Bible Church membership class will be held at 945 during Sunday school on Sunday, April 28th, and Sunday, May 5th. So if you're signed up, please take note of that. And you can still sign up out at the connection table if interested to get in on that class. It's going to be held in the back of the sanctuary. We're going to put the walls up, and that's where that class will be held during Sunday school on those two dates. Join us for prayer uh, and Bible study this Wednesday at 7 p.m. And for Awana and youth group tonight from 6 to 8 p.m. Thank you. All right, lots of great things coming up. Make sure to mark your calendars so you don't miss out. Uh, it's good to get involved and uh, with your Crossroads family, and uh, what a great time of fellowship you can have. So isn't it great to, to feel love and uh, to be loved by others? You know, as we, as we grow, we're, we come into this world, and you feel the love of your parents. Um, you know, you might feel the love of siblings and uh, family, family members all around you, and and you might at one point get married and feel the love of, of a spouse. Um, but there's one person that loves you far greater than that, and that's Jesus Christ. Um, you know, he laid down his life uh, to pay your sin's debt. Then uh, the Bible says that there, uh, greater love hath no man than, than one that lays down his life for his brother. And uh, there's no one, no one that loves you better than Jesus. If you're able to stand, how about standing as we sing?
see you in the sunrise every morning It's like a picture that you've painted for me A love letter in the sky Story I could have had a really different story you came down from heaven to restore me Forever save my life Nobody loves me like you love me, Jesus I stand in awe of your amazing worship you as long as I am breathing. God, you are faithful and true. Nobody loves me like you. Mountains, you're breaking down the weight of all my mountains. Even when it feels like I'm surrounded. leave my side oh nobody loves me like you love me Jesus I stand in all of your amazing ways I worship you as long as I am breathing God you are faithful and true nobody loves me like you Oh what a song to sing Oh what a song to sing Oh what a song to sing a song my heart keeps singing oh what a song to sing oh what a song to sing oh what a song to sing Jesus you love me and I love you God nobody me like you love me, Jesus. I stand in awe of your amazing ways. I worship you as long as I am breathing. God, I will worship you forever. Worship you. Nobody loves me like you love me, Jesus. I stand in your amazing ways. I worship you as long as I am breathing. God, you are faithful and true. Nobody loves me like you. Nobody loves me like you love me, Jesus. I stand in awe of your amazing ways. Nobody me like you. Nobody loves me like you. Amen. You know, when we come to know the Lord and make him Savior, uh, he makes us one of his own, and uh, we are bound to him eternally. We are eternally secure, uh, and we have the, the assurance that we are bound for heaven and eternity with, with God the Father and uh, with Jesus Christ our Savior. And uh, I'm just so thankful today for that blessed assurance that we have through Jesus. Blessed assurance 
Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. day long perfect submission perfect delight visions of rapture First on my side, air of standing, bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story. This is my song.
amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me i once was lost but now i'm found was blind but now i see twas grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains are gone I've been set free We are just so grateful for the promise that we are forever yours. Lord, we that have called you to be our Lord and Savior and ask you to, uh, to, to guide, guide us and, and be our master. Lord, we have the eternal security and the hope in you that we will spend eternity in your presence and worshiping you forever. Lord, you are worthy, worthy of all our praise. Lord, we come this morning to just worship you to pour our love on you and lift you above all others because you alone are worthy. Lord, we just, we love you. We love you that you loved us so much 
that even while we were yet sinners, you went to the cross and you died for us. You gave your life as payment for our sins. Lord, we can never repay that debt, but we can just serve you each day and follow you as Lord and Master. We just thank you, Lord. We just ask now that you would move in this place, Lord. Uh, Holy Spirit, just touch each heart. Just open our hearts that we would receive a, a great message from you this morning that would encourage us to follow you and, and uh, give up control of our lives and let you have full control of everything that we are, everything that we have, because it's all yours, Lord. Just help us to do that. Lord, give Pastor Mark the boldness as he comes. Give him the words to speak that will come forth and, and change hearts this morning. Lord, we just thank you so much for your word that it's sure, that it's true. And, and in all these, uh, these crazy times that we face, we have a, a firm foundation in your word. Thank you, Lord. We just ask now that uh, you would move in this place, touch hearts, and change lives. And we give you this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Take your Bibles, if you will, turn to Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9. I have something I want you to pray for. I'm asking you to. Um, some folks, friends, had posted some things on Facebook this morning. It was about something that took place yesterday. And I think it was in Mineral County, West Virginia, is where I'm getting the location. In Mineral County, they had ministry teams go into the, the, the uh, schools in Mineral County and uh, Hampshire County and over there, uh, just on the other side of the river from Cumberland. And 350 teenagers gave their hearts to the Lord. 350. <clears throat> 90, 90 of those kids saved were from uh, Frankfurt High School. And so uh, that's exciting. On Friday mornings, I had breakfast with in the mornings. At 6.30, I eat with some, some guys, uh, and uh, one, of the, one of the guys I eat with is the uh, football coach from Frankfurt High School. So I'll be, it'll be kind of fun picking his brain a little bit about what went on and what took place uh, down there in uh, Mineral County and Hampshire County. So pray for that. Pray that those decisions were real. Pray that those kids will grow in grace and knowledge. Uh, and it just shows you that uh, God is still in the salvation business. Um, I, I just got some bits and pieces of some information before the sermon uh, service here the se uh, in the second service where down around Georgia, I think down in Georgia, they're experiencing mass revival. And matter of fact, at Georgia, University of Georgia, and they're baptizing kids in the beds of trucks. Holy cow, I didn't know I was driving around in a baptismal. But anyway, that's pretty cool. We can lead somebody to the Lord and just get them in the back of the truck. But anyway. Maybe not. Okay. So anyway, but that's pretty neat to see what the Lord is doing. And uh, we need to understand that when I say that, that is so encouraging. But then when you turn the news on and you see Iran sending bombs to Israel, they're sending drones. I mean, do you understand what's going on here? And we understand that what we need to do is we need to be praying for Israel. But we also know that um, the time is getting close. Uh, Israel is God's prophetic calendar. If you want to look at the clock to see what time it is in prophecy, look at Israel and see what's taking place over there. They showed a map, and when you look at the map, there was just this little sliver of land. That was Israel, completely surrounded by people that would be their enemies. And I'm thinking, wow. You know, God's saving people. God is doing some wonderful things, but he's also moving that prophetic calendar. That needle is getting closer to the day that we hear that trumpet blow and we're out of here. So I think it's a it's a call to all of us to wake up and to get busy for the Lord. Amen. Amen. What an encouragement. Well, today we're looking at Revelation chapter nine. And I entitled the message, Hell on Earth. This is, this is not something you want to preach on. This is not something I want to preach on. I'd rather preach on something else. But, you know, here we are. We're going through the scriptures. We're going through Revelation. <clears throat> we're looking at verse by verse. And we're noticing and we're seeing things that are literal. These are not figurative. These are not something that's allegory, but this is literal as we look at it, things that are going to take place on this earth uh, when the church is gone right after in the tribulation period. 
I have a book on my shelf. It's called uh, Erasing Hell by Francis Chan. And I picked it up and I, and I just started the reading in the introduction. And I thought, man, this is really good. But let me read this and then we'll get started into the message. He said, if you're excited, now what did I say the title was? Erasing Hell. He said, if you're excited about, uh, uh, to read this book, you have issues. He said, do you understand the weight of uh, what we are about to consider? We're exploring the possibility that you and I may end up being tormented in hell if you're lost. Excited would be the wrong term to use here. Necessary would be, the, be more fitting. For some, this discussion will open up old wounds. It certainly has for me, and this is what I wanted to share. This is a story from uh, Francis Chan, and it's a short story, but it says this. It says, for some, the discussion will open up old wounds. And he says this, the saddest day in my life was the day that I watched my grandmother die. When that EKG monitor flatlined, I freaked out. I absolutely lost it. According to what I knew of the Bible, she was headed for a life of never-ending suffering. I thought I would go crazy. He says, I have never cried harder, and I don't want to feel like that again. He says, since that day, I've tried not to think about it. It has been over 20 years. Even as I write the, that paragraph, I feel sick. I would love to erase hell from the pages of Scripture. How about you? Have you ever struggled with hell as I have? Do you have any parents, siblings, cousins, or friends who, based on what you have been taught, will end up in hell? What a bone-chilling thought. Until recently, whenever the idea of hell, uh, when, whenever the idea of hell and the idea of my loved ones possibly heading there crossed my mind, I would brush it aside, divert my thinking by something more pleasant. While I've always believed in hell with my mind, I tried not to let it uh, let the doctrine penetrate my heart. And I think that's the, the truth of it. I think so many of us today, even sitting here, if we would talk about it and we'd say, do you believe in hell? Yep, I believe it's a literal place. I believe the Bible clearly teaches about hell. And then when we'd say, well, what are you doing with your friends and your family that are lost? Nothing. Do we believe it? And the fact of the matter is, is that that's, that's something we have to consider. Hell is a place designed uh, to punish those who lived in rebellion against God while on earth, and people avoid that subject. Now, what I want you to know here today is that nobody has to go there. If you go to hell, it's because you choose to. We will preach the cross. We'll preach the blood of Christ. We will preach redemption. We will preach salvation, being born again. How to know for sure that if you die, you can go to heaven over and over and over again. We'll preach that. And if you reject that, then that's your choice. They even write it out of their theology. Some people don't want it, so they write it out of their theology. So not to offend people. Preachers won't even preach on it because it's offensive. How offended is somebody going to be that if they end up there? The bottom line is I'm obligated to preach it because it's in the Bible. And if it's in the Bible, that is my responsibility to tell and to share. And nobody can make something not true simply by denying it. You cannot make something not true simply by denying it. Chapter 12 of Revelation gives us a glimpse into the horrors of hell. What we see uh, in here should be enough to unsettle anyone's conviction that hell is nothing to be concerned about. So as we look through chapter 9 of Revelation, we are going to see what hell looks like as it's poured out on earth during the tribulation period. While I'm sure that most of us believe there is a hell in our minds, do we acknowledge it when we acknowledge it with our lips, but do we believe it in our hearts? Well, that may be understandable for the world. It's not understandable for the church of Jesus Christ. Every born-again believer, you know, when we get saved, we're, what are we saved from? We're saved from the wrath of God. Because God is holy, righteous, and just. And God has got to judge sin. He must. He cannot overlook it. So God in His sovereign grace has sent Jesus to come to this earth to take on the form of a man to die for you. 
He died on that cross, was buried and rose again, victorious over sin, death, and the grave. And what God basically does is save you from himself. Because of his righteousness, God said, the only way out for mankind is for me to pay for sins myself. So I will send my son. He will come into this world and he will die for your sins. But he'll rise again, victorious over sin, death, and grave and prove that I have accepted the payment of sin by my son's death on the cross. And if you reject that, then God says one day you will either suffer in hell or if you're alive and you reject Christ and the Lord comes back, you will suffer hell on earth first. And that's what we're looking at in this passage of Scripture today is we see exactly what it's going to look like. And I, you know, I can name a whole, lot, a whole bunch of pastors, pastors on TV, and if I said their name, you might get offended. And you might feel kind of bad or you might know exactly who I'm talking about. You would because they're pretty popular. You'll never, ever hear them speak, uh, uh, mention the name of hell. You'll never because it's too offensive. And so it's sad because the Bible presents hell as a literal place. And I wrote this down and this wasn't something I coined. This is something somebody else coined. But it's this. Hell is too long to be wrong. Hell is too long to be wrong. And to review what we're, uh, what we're looking at, and we're going to look at what we just did. Remember, we're looking at the seventh seal. Remember, God, uh, God gave the son. He gave him the seal, or he gave him the scroll. The scroll was the title deed to take back the earth. Remember, when Adam and Eve sinned, they were given the title deed. But when they sinned, they gave the title deed over to Satan. And then during the tribulation period, God takes back, Christ takes back that title deed. That is what the seal is, or the scroll is, with the seven seals. And that's what we've been looking at over the last several weeks. We're looking at that. And so the six seals are opened, and the seventh seal, we find the seven trumpets of, uh, trumpets of, ju of judgments. And remember what we said, there's the seven trumpets. Seven seal judgments, one, two, three, four, five, six. And when he opens the seventh, out comes the seven trumpet judgments, one, two, three, four, five, six. And on that seventh trumpet judgment, when it's blown, comes the seven bowl judgments, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And they come like rapid fire. And these things are happen happening over a seven year period as all hell is going to be poured on earth. Did I mention you don't have to be here? Did I mention that those who are saved will be in heaven worshiping the Lord? Chapters 4 and 5 of Revelation. Woo! We're in heaven worshiping the Lamb. Amen. I'm not going to be here. I put my faith and trust in Christ, not in myself, because I will let me down every time, but Jesus will never let me down. And so we see that very clearly. Look, if you will, in chapter 5. And we'd look at the first five verses, and it says here, When I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. That is the title deed to the earth. I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly. That's John who's writing this. I began to leap, uh, weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one, look what it says in verse 5. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, was who has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And so we see where Christ opens them up. We looked in the, in the past in chapter 6, when we looked at that, we looked at the first seal, chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, where we saw the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Number one horse, the white horse, which is when the Antichrist comes on the scene. Remember, we're gone, chapter 4 and 5, we're in heaven, we're worshiping the Lord, we now have our glorified bodies, we're getting ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb, and at the end of the seven-year tribulation period, we come back with the Lord, with Him, and He destroys the 
his enemies with the brightness of his coming and with the sword of the word of God, he destroys them and we come back with him. He establishes the millennial kingdom and we will be with him to rule and reign for 1,000 years. Woo! The bottom line is, now he's opening up the first seal. This is in the first half of the tribulation period. The first, half, uh, the first seal is the white horse. It's the false peace that the Antichrist will bring. Second seal that the, that the Lamb of God opens up is the red horse. That second seal is the red horse. That's war. That's the shedding of blood. That is what comes on. So there's peace, false peace. And then the second red horse comes on, and now we have war. And then the black horse comes on. That's death and starvation, famine. And then we see the, the, all the pestilence that comes as the result of war and everything else. That comes on the earth. And then the fourth seal, that is the gray horse. That is death and Hades that follow him. And so we see that very clearly that the lamb is the one who opens up those seals and opens it up. The fifth seal that we looked at in chapter 6, verses 9 and 11, were the souls under the altar. Remember, we looked at that. There are people who are going to get saved during the first half of the tribulation. They'll be getting saved. Remember the silent witness? Those that, you know, leave Bibles around. By the way, do you realize when you're out of here and you are raptured out as a believer, somebody else is going to come into your house and rifle through your goods. Somebody else is going to get your bank account. Somebody, wouldn't it be great if they got that stuff, they found the Bible and told them how to be saved? And so during the first half of the tribulation, during this time, their souls under the altar, they, they, they will get saved, but they will be martyred. That's what will happen during that time. The sixth seal then is when God shakes the earth, when we, we realize the natural disasters, we see the earthquakes, we see everything that's going to take place during that time. Chapter 7 is a parenthetical chapter. That is a timeout, if you will. Chapter 7 comes, and all of a sudden there's a timeout. And it's expansive. It's more information telling you what's going to take place. In that time, we see revival in the tribulation. <clears throat> Excuse me, there's 144,000, 12,000 every tribe of Israel. Jews, remember what we said? They're spiritual, Holy Spirit-filled, Jewish Billy Graham's running all over the place, winning people to Christ. They are sealed so they cannot be martyred. And so God in his grace is now allowing somebody to go throughout the whole earth, preach the gospel. People will get saved. Those who get saved will get martyred. And we'll see that that's very clear in the passage. <clears throat> then we looked at chapter 8, verses 1 through 13 which is the opening of the seventh seal. So if you go over there, chapter 8, and look at verse 1, and when the Lamb opened the seventh seal, remember the seventh seal, when it's opened up, opens up the seven trumpet judgments. So the seventh seal opens up, and then bam, you got seven trumpet judgments, which brings more hardship and more persecution uh, to the face of the earth, which is the opening up of that, and it contains the seven judgments. And so we saw in chapter 8 the first four trumpet judgments, and we took notice of them. Then at the end of chapter 8, at the conclusion of the fourth trumpet judgment, that's what we looked at. If you will, look at verse 13. When I looked and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead. Whoa, that's judgment. Whoa, whoa, whoa to those who dwell on the earth. Who are the ones who are dwelling on the earth? They're Christ rejectors. They hate God. They hate his Christ. They hate believers. They hate everybody like that. Whoa, whoa, whoa to those who dwell on the earth at the blast of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. So you have the four trumpet judgments and then you have three more trumpet judgments to go. And when I think about that, whoa, 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 and I'm just going to take you on a little ride with me in my mind when I begin to read, I'm at my desk and I'm reading this stuff and I'm thinking about all this stuff taking place on earth. I'm thinking about the Antichrist. I'm thinking about the persecution of believers. I'm thinking about all that. And I'm also looking ahead at what's going to take place on earth. And I begin to think about how bad this earth is. And then I began to think, okay, look what's going on in Israel now. You have Iran sending uh, bombs and, and drones over Israel uh, to kill as many Jews as they possibly can. And I'm thinking, man, the world is mustering up the worst it can. 
my dad was a World War II guy. My dad, and which made me interested in World War II. My dad used to love to watch the old World War II movies. I used to watch them with him because we only had one TV and it was my, you know. So that was it. That was your default show you were going to watch that night. But anyway, I watched this one movie not too long ago. It was a movie that, as it went, it was about uh, World War II. It was about these tanks, this tank battle. And in this midst of this tank battle, you have the American Sherman tanks taking on the German Tiger uh, tanks, which was the top uh, tank in Germany, which, I mean, they were massive and they were powerful. And it was impossible for a Sherman tank to stand up against a Tiger. I'm taking you a little journey here on a rail tra uh, rabbit trail, but it'll just listen. And so what happened was after this firefight, after these guys got in this tank battle, one Sherman tank remained. And it was these guys in this tank in the movie. And what they did is they thought, well, hey, we're all by ourselves now, but let's finish the mission. So they went down this long road and they were going into this town. And when they went into the town, all oh, their tank hit a, a landmine, which blew the track off of the tank. And so they were stuck and they had to wait there until the mechanic could fix the tank track. That's what they were waiting on. In the meantime, they sent a young man, he was the youngest member of the tank crew, ahead up the road as far as they could to keep a lookout on what was coming. Here's what the guy saw. And when I think about this, I think of the pure evil of, of the SS uh, Nazis in Germany. Just watch this. This thing just overwhelmed my heart when I think about it because I can't even imagine being there. And he spots these. These are the SS Battalion. A wicked, ruthless bunch of men. And that song is a song that they actually sung when they would march. Thank you, Chris. When I looked up the SS Battalion, I looked up the SS Troops. They give the qualifications online. You can look it up yourself. And they had to be tall. They had to be blonde. They had to be blue-eyed. And they had to be of the Aryan race. These guys were so filled for hate and all this kind of stuff. And that was in our time. That was before I was born. And I'm thinking all the evil that is out there, it won't even compare to what's going to take place during the tribulation period. They're going to be murdering, martyring Christians like left and right as soon as they accept Christ as their Savior. They're going to be gone. They're going to be wasted immediately. And I think to myself, here I am a believer. Who do I, I mean, why would I not tell somebody, somebody about Jesus? Who, when is the Lord going to return? I don't know. But when I look at Israel and I see what's going on over there and I see the atrocities over there, I know that that is my clock. And as I watch Israel and see what's going on over there, oh, I want to make sure that I'm taking note and realizing that the hour is short. We don't have a lot of time. How much, Pastor? I have no idea. Nobody knows the day or the hour. But the bottom line is, the Bible says, when you see the fig tree and it's full bloom, you know that summer is nigh. And I'm going to tell you, say, the fig tree is in full bloom. And we know that the Lord's return is very close. I believe that with my whole heart. And the bottom line is, is so what am I going to do with the information? What are you going to do with the information that we receive? Because this is history written in advance, that we can see what literally is going to take place on the face of the earth. Why? Because he's a holy God, and he's going to take care of evil. He's going to judge evil, and he's going to take care of business when he comes. He was the Lamb of God before the foundation of the world. He was beaten. He was spat upon. He was crucified. But he's coming back as the Lion of Judah. And when he comes back on that horse, he's going to defeat his enemies with the brightness of his coming, with the sword of the word that comes out of his mouth. He's going to defeat them. And we're coming back with him. But in the meantime, we got to know what's ahead. 
what's going to take place. And so when we look at this, we've got to realize what's going to happen. Take your Bibles, if you will, turn chapter 9, look at verses 1 through 12. Stand with me as we've made a habit of to believe God when God says, I'll bless those who read the word, I'll bless those who hear the word, and I'll bless those who obey the word. And that's what we're here to do. We're here to claim the promises of God. Amen? Follow along as I read. And, and he says, And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the, and, and the air were darkened with the smoke of this shaft. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. They were, they were told not to harm the grass or, uh, of the earth or any green excuse me, green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not kill them. Uh, and their, their torment, uh, the, excuse me, and their torment was like, now notice the, the term like, uh, the torment of the, of the scorpion when it stings, when it stings someone. And those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will, they will long to die, but death will flee from them. And the appearance of the locusts were like horses uh, prepared for battle. And their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. And their faces were like human faces. Uh, their, their hair was like women's hair. And their teeth like the lion's teeth. He says they had breastplates like breastplates of iron. And the noise of their wings was like uh, the noise of many chariots with horses rush, uh, rushing into battle. And they have tails and stings like scorpions. And the, and the excuse me, they have tails and stings like scorpions. And their power to hurt people for five months is in their tails. They have a king over them and the angel uh, uh, over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, the name in his, the, his name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek, his name is Apollyon. And the first woe has passed. Behold, two woes are still to come. Father, we ask that you would just illuminate our minds. Help us to understand, Father, that the things to come are not good. Father, they, uh, they achieve a purpose and a plan. But, Father, there's going to be pain and suffering, and people do not have to go there. They do not have to be there, Father. All they have to do is put their faith and trust in the gospel to be saved. But they reject, and people who reject will go through these horrible things. Help us, Father, take these things to mind and to our hearts. Help us to be able to share with others. Father, help it to encourage us, just like over in Mineral County. Hundreds of kids are getting saved. The fields are white unto harvest, but the labors are few. Father, help us to believe you. Help us not to believe a lie. Help us to go forth with the gospel, the good news of grace, just to tell the truth, Lord. And as we go and tell them how they can, when they die, they can have a home in heaven with you, guaranteed because of the price that was paid on Calvary. God, we ask that you just now just be with us. Do what only you can do in this place. Change hearts and lives. And Father, I pray by the end of this sermon, if somebody in this, in this place will want to be saved, to truly be saved and not put it off any longer. We ask this in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Look at number one then in your notes there. The star fallen from heaven. Let's put this together. What is John telling us? Remember, John is getting a revelation from God on the things that will happen in the future. Remember in, in chapters 4 and 5, uh, John goes, he's, uh, he's caught up into heaven, and he's in the presence of God, and that's when P, the, the church will be raptured up. And then chapter 6 on through is when it talks about what's going to take place in the tribulation period. But look, if you will, in chapter 9, verse 1, and understand, a star fallen from heaven. He says there in verse 1, a, I saw, excuse me, a star fall in past tense. The tense of this is past tense. Some Bibles say, I saw a star fall from heaven as if it just currently happened. No, John's saying that the star he saw had already fallen 
from heaven to the earth. And this is this person is unnamed. This is an individual. This has this this person has a personality. He has personhood. And so when we look at that, we have to ask who in the world is this person? Isaiah chapter 14. Look, if you will, verse 12, how you are fallen from heaven. O day star, son of the dawn, how you are cut down to the ground. You who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. Who's that? That's Lucifer. He said, above of the stars of God, I will set my throne on high. Look at his pride and his arrogance. He wanted to be like God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the far reaches of the north. Verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like God. I'm going to make myself like God. The most high, he said um, in verse 15, but you are brought down uh, to shoal, to hell, uh, to a far reaches of the pit. And that's what we're talking about is that pit here in just a second. Luke chapter 10 and verse 18. There are many who believe as I read through uh, this this verse and looking. And as I said, I have a little bit of an interest in World War Two and I'm kind of looking at, man, these SS troops and how you know how they are um satan and um, possessed and how they are just i mean they're just evil and as i read that i came across one commentator who said that this verse luke chapter 10 and verse 18 was an inspirational verse out of the bible to put the ss which is lightning bolts on the on the ss troops lapel he said to them I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Jesus said that. He saw, he was there in the very beginning when Satan was kicked out of heaven. And he says, and I saw uh, Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And that is nothing, none other than Lucifer. Revelation 12, verses 7 through 9. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven. Verse 9. And the great dragon was thrown down, the ancient of the, uh, that ancient serpent, who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And there we have a picture of who this is, this individual is. In chapter 9 and verse 1, this is Satan. That fallen star from heaven is none other than Satan himself. Number two, unlocking the abyss. Number two, unlocking the abyss. Look at chapter 9, verse 1 again, the second part. And he who, the star that was fallen, was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. The word pit there is the word, literally means the abyss. The Greek word for abyss is abyssos, means bottomless. It appears seven times in Revelation and always in reference to the abode of the incarcerated demons. And so when we see this, Jesus gives Satan the keys. He opens up the abyss, which is the shaft, to the bottomless pit, the abyss, where those chained um, um, demons are in, in that place. Verse 9, if you will, chapter 2, excuse me, chapter 9, verse 2 again. He, Satan, opened his shaft of the bottomless pit for the purpose. Why did he open it up? For letting uh, out of all the demons chained in hell so they can go upon the earth in full force. Now listen to me. All the demons of hell are not let loose now. And do you realize all the evil we see on the face of the earth The Bible says that we are what? We are the restraining force. The Holy Spirit is the restraining force of evil today. And once the church is gone and we're raptured out and we're in the presence of God, that restraining force is taken away and all of a sudden all hell breaks loose. But then there's a time where Jesus hands the keys to the abyss to Satan who goes and opens it up and then unchains the rest of the demons and all hell is poured out on earth. I want to tell you, you don't want to be here. You don't have to be here. 
And when that shaft is open, smoke billowed out of that, and all of those demons come flying out of there. Letter A, then, in your notes, is a place hated by demons. Verse 9. Look at verse 9 again, second part of verse 9. He said, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit and realizing that it was a place that the demons want to be. Look at Luke chapter 8. We have it up here. You'll remember uh, the, the story of the Jesus told. He said, and when they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, he said, uh, which is opposite of Galilee. Now watch. When Jesus had stepped out, of the, uh, out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. He said, for a long time he had worn no clothes, and he had not lived in the house but among the, among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. He said, for he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under the guard and, uh, and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by, by the demon into the desert. Look at this. And Jesus then asked him, what is your name? He said, Legion. For many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. In other words, these demons that Jesus cast out of this guy, this demon-possessed guy, Legion, they didn't want, they said, they begged Jesus, don't send us back to the abyss. We don't want to go there. It is a place that is hated by the demons, and they didn't want to go there. They wanted to be free to roam. So what did Jesus do? He said, okay, and he sent them into a whole herd of hogs that ran off a cliff, and of course they drowned themselves, but the bottom line is, and why did that hurt? Is because demons need a host. They need to be somewhere to live. And so here we have all of this taking place. And so these demons wanted to be free to roam. They did not want to be sent back to the abyss where they would be confined. And so what that tells us, there are many angels not free, but they're confined in the abyss. Look at Jude chapter 6. Why are they there? And it says, and the angels who, who did not stay within their own position of authority. So in other words, before the flood, there were people on the face of the earth, and there were men, and there were the daughters of men, and then you had these men who were demon-possessed. It's when those demon-possessed men had relations with these women, and they created this demonic race on earth. You can read about it. You'll read about that demonic race in Genesis on earth. And so what happened was this. And the angels that did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains in the abyss. Look now, he has kept them in eternal chains under the gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. And so we see very clearly that they're there because they left their their, their, their uh, estate where they're supposed to be. And so they were chained in the abyss. And these angels rebelled against God and heaven being their proper domain. And, and so they left and they were kicked out of heaven and then they dwelt these men. All right, Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41. Then they, he will say to the, those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Listen to me. God doesn't send anybody to hell. You choose to go there. Devil was ne the hell was never prepared for man. The only reason man goes to hell is because man chooses to follow the demons. It's the only reason. Because God says right there very clearly, into the eternal fire prepared for what? The devil and his angels. Hell wasn't prepared for man. But that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing hell opened up. We're seeing in those demons that were chained being set loose. So number one, the place of demons hated. Number two, letter B, a place where Jesus preached. I like this. Jesus preached there. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 and 19. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring to us God, uh, being put in uh, 
put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Verse 19, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. In other words, when Jesus died on the cross, he was put in the tomb. Once he died, his soul went and preached in the lower parts. He preached to the Old Testament saints, and he also preached to those demons of hell. What did he preach? The gospel? No way. He went down and said, I'm free. I've won the victory. I've won the victory over sin, death, and the grave. Nobody has to come here because I've won the victory. Amen. That's what he preached. Jesus went to that lower part and preached. He preached in the abyss between his death and resurrection. And he preached victory over death, hell, and the grave. All the demons of hell thought the crucifixion was final. Can you imagine? They were cheering. They were roaring. He was in the ground. He was dead for three days. But after three days and three nights, man, he come flying out of that grave. Amen? called the resurrection. Letter C, the place controlled by Jesus. Look at verse 1, if you will. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He was given the key. He was given the key because Jesus held the key. Revelation 1 and verse 18. It says, and the living one, I died. Behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Christ had the keys. He handed the keys to Satan to open up the shaft to the bottomless pit, the abyss, to allow all those demons who were chained down there in the abyss to get loose and to come out. And so part of the judgment God is bringing on the earth is, is this unleashed demonic power in the second half of the tribulation. You don't need to be here. I ain't going to be here. And so what we need to understand is God is in control. God is in control. But you know what else we understand? I read this over and over. and I'm, Man, this is gloomy. Holy cow, these people are going to go unmerciful judgment of these creatures, these demonic creatures coming out of the abyss, out of the pit. Oh, my golly. Do you know that any moment they could receive Christ as their Savior? Any moment these people were under the judgment of these demonic powers could get saved? Any moment God's grace extends that to them. Do you realize that the Bible says today, broad is the road that leads to destruction and many be there at, and narrow is the path that leads to righteousness. Only few be there that find it. But it's open to everybody. The gospel is open to everybody in here. The gospel is open to anybody that wants to be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Did you ever wonder why people won't do that? Did you ever wonder why? It's because evil is bound up in the heart of the man. Jeremiah says, the heart is evil above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Your heart and my heart. If it wasn't for the grace of God, who knows where I'd be? Do you know, but for the grace of God, I could have been an Iranian? Do you know if it wasn't for the grace of God, I could have been in Afghanistan? If it wasn't for the grace of God, I could have been Chinese? But for the grace of God, I am where I am and who I am, all because of what God has done for me. And so the star falling from heaven, that's number one. Unlock the abyss. Unlocking the abyss is number two. Number three, the power of the pit. The power of the pit. Look at verse three. He says in verse 3, uh, Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. And so here they are, these, these creatures, these demonic creatures, are given power. Now, i got to tell you, when, we knew every, when I knew everything when I was younger, I remember after I got first got saved, well, I know what that is. I know what these demonic creatures are. They're helicopters. Helicopters are rising up out of the, uh, out of the abyss. And man, they, look, you know, and when you look at the description, you're thinking, well, I wasn't a bad guess. But these are not helicopters. They're demonic. They're demons from the pit 
of hell. Now we'll look at him. The power of the pit. He said Jesus speaks of hell as a place where the fire never goes out. Mark chapter 9 and verse 48. So what we're seeing in a description during the tribulation period is actually a description of what's going on in hell. He said, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Luke chapter 3 and verse 17. The winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And so we know that hell is a place of fire and smoke. It is a place of suffering. It is a place where it's tor- people are tormented. Look at verse 4. Chapter, or yeah, chapter 9, verse 4. They were told not to harm, look, the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree. Now, some people believe they were just enlarged locusts. Well, a real locust will eat everything that is green. You all know we're going to have a swarm of locusts coming up here this summer, right? Thanks, Pastor. Yeah, we're supposed to, and they, and they go through, and they, they kill everything. And so we know that these locusts do not. And said, oh, but only those who do not have the seal of God in their foreheads. And so when we look at these, these, these um, locusts that come up out of the pit, they are demonic creatures. John, in his best effort as he gets the revelation from God, is describing to us in advance of what's going to take place as we look at that. And it says here, but only those who do not have the seal of God in their foreheads. In some way, somehow, those who are born again, those of us who are saved, are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You know that. We're sealed into the day of redemption. So we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. But there's something going on here that those who are on earth at this time and are sealed and are saved But God has some kind of a sign. God has something that is identifiable as his during the tribulation period. And it says there, you can't harm them. In other words, you can't harm to save people. These demons will be harming the lost people that are on the face of the earth. And God prevents the saved during this small, short term from being hurt or hindered by these uh, demonic um, locusts. And so look, if you will, at letter A, what demons look like. Well, chapter 7, look, if it will, and said in appearance, locusts were, and I want you to notice the word like. Anytime you see in the Bible, like, as, you know it's not that, but it's like that. And so as John gives us this, this description, he uses, excuse me, the word like. In appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. So number one there, in your notes there, they are powerful. These locusts are powerful. There's nothing more majestic and more powerful looking than a horse. If you've ever watched war movies or you've watched gladiator movies or you've watched something like that and you see them lining up the cavalry as they're getting ready and you see these horses prancing around and you see their muscles bulging and they're pawing at the dirt and everything, that's what John is seeing. John is looking over at these things that look like locusts, and man, they are powerful. They look like horses. They look like these powerful horses prepared for battle. So John sees them in their strength. Number two, they anticipate victory. These creatures don't anticipate losing. They anticipate victory. Verse 7, on their heads, uh, on their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. And these crowns are what they call the Stephanus in the Greek. That is the victor's crown. So as they look at this, John's looking at these, these uh, locusts, these, these demons. They are, they, they look, they're powerful and they're arrogant and they're ready for victory. And then the third thing is they're intelligent. Look at verse uh, 7 again. And their faces were like Human faces didn't say they were human faces. It appeared that way. What he's saying is these creatures were intelligent. They were rational and they were highly organized forces of evil. And so this is a very intimidating picture that John is seeing about these demons as they come out of the abyss, out of that 
of, of that hole. And so they are, they are also seductive. Now, I'm going to take and plead the fifth and say I'm not responsible for the words that I'm about to say. Verse 8 says this, And their hair was like a woman's hair. Now, I'm not sure exactly what that means. All I'm going to say is that a woman's glory is in her hair. A woman's beauty, that's why it takes two, three hours in the morning to get ready for church. It's because her beauty is in her hair and she's taking care of her hair. That is a woman's beauty. That is her pride. That is her treasure. So what are we looking at then if that is the case? What does that mean? And so what we see is that these creatures, although powerful, although intelligent and all that, they are very seductive and they are very enticing and they are very captivating for whatever. That's what they're trying, uh, John's trying to tell us. Number five, they are fierce. They are mean, they are fierce. But why? Verse 8, their teeth like lion's teeth. What, did you ever see a lion roar? I don't want to see one up close. But the bottom line is a lion's teeth are meant to rip and to shred flesh, to rip it apart. And so John, as he sees this, he's seeing these creatures out of the abyss coming up, these demonic uh, creatures, and they are fierce. And they're ready to rip their their victims apart then number six they're invulnerable verse nine they had breastplates like breastplates of iron so they have all kinds of protection and so when john looks at them that they're protected and there's nobody on earth that's going to touch them the only person that can defeat them is christ himself and then number seven they're intimidating look at verse nine and the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. So they're very, very intimidating too. So these creatures that John sees, uh, he sees their appearance. And I want to tell you something, they're intimidating creatures. And they're going to come out of the abyss. They have been chained and now they're going to be let loose. And they're going to now come out and they're going to punish those on earth. So number one, we have letter A, we have the appearance of demons. Letter B, their mission is to hurt people. Now, we've already mentioned that, but let's look at it in verse 10. Number one, their sting is painful. Now, I looked it up on the Internet because I wanted more information on, on talking about um, creatures and, and scorpions and things like that. Uh, what, it, what kind of a sting do they have? And to find out that they have all these things that, I mean, they, they can sting you, but it's not deadly. And so we see that. Okay? So it's going to be painful. Number two, their pain is extended. And their power they had, and their power to hurt people for five months. Now, where does the five months come from? I have no idea. All I know is that an actual locust lasts five months. It will last from May to September, and then they die. I don't know if it's something that has to do with that or not, but they will last for five months. Number three, their attack is targeted. They will not attack the 144,000 that are already sealed. They will not attack anybody that's now born again at that time. And then their torment is not lethal. It will not kill. Can you imagine going through being stung by these scorpions, which have tremendous pain, but you can't die? You know an image I have in my mind? My mind is back when the two Twin Towers got hit by those planes. Do you remember that? And then all of a sudden when those planes were engulfed in flames, and you saw people jump out of those windows because the heat was so intense, they tried to escape it that they jumped out the windows. You imagine during the tribulation being in so much pain that you wish to die and you cannot? That's what, what the Bible tells us. Now, let's close. Verse 11. They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, that's Satan. His name in the Hebrew is Abaddon. In the Greek, he's called, in the Greek, he's called Apollyon. Now watch. The first woe is past. Behold, two woes are still to come. Whoa. Why? Because God hates evil. 
God cannot give man a pass. This is, this is for the purpose of bringing Israel back to him and establishing his kingdom for a thousand years. But you don't have to be there. And people will just harden up their hearts. I don't care. I don't, want to know. I don't want this Jesus thing. I don't want Jesus in my life. I'm not bowing my heart's knee down to anybody. I don't care. But the other thing is this. Everything that we've studied so far is a warning. It's a warning. The image of hell are to warn us about the reality of hell. The images of the tribulation period are to warn us that it's coming. Hell is a place of fire and smoke populated by creatures whose only purpose is to inflict pain and suffering. There is only one way to avoid the pain of hell. And that's to embrace the cross. That's it. Every head bowed and every eye closed. This stuff isn't easy to preach. I'd rather give you some fluff. But the bottom line is, this God's word. God tells us exactly what's going to take place. Jesus came the first time as a lamb led to slaughter. Comes the second time. He's coming as the lion of Judah. When he pours out all his wrath during the tribulation period, it's meant to bring Israel back to him. Others will get saved too. There will be Gentiles getting saved. And they'll realize that Jesus is Messiah. But I have to ask a pointed question. What does this mean to you? Number one, you don't want your worst enemy to go to hell. You see, we believe it in our heads, but sometimes we don't believe it in our hearts. You can give me the theology of hell, but you can't give me the reality of it in your life as far as, you know, encouraging you to go out and share with somebody. And how dare us, how dare us pick and choose who, will, who is worthy of the gospel and who's not? I don't know who's going to accept Christ. But what encouraging news in Mineral County down there in Cumberland and over 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 the river and over there in West Virginia, 350 kids who expressed that they have accepted Christ as their Savior. Fields are white unto harvest, folks. But the labors are few. All you have to do today, if you're here and you don't know for sure, you might be sitting there and you might be like, man, I don't know for sure. Here's what you do. You just make sure. Recognize that God is a holy God. Recognize, number two, that you're not. And that your sin separates you from going to heaven. Number three, that God understands so much so that he sent Jesus to, t- to die and take our place on, on, on the cross, but to die, to be buried, and rise again, victorious over sin, death, and the grave, and to realize that God is saving us from himself. But the, but the hardest part is to move it from your head to your heart. Cry out to God and say, God, I surrender. I am tired of running. I surrender. Lord Jesus, come into my life and save me. If you're a believer here today, folks, we got to get on the ball. And if Jesus doesn't come back for 100 years, that's fine. Because I'll be winning people to Jesus for 100 years. Amen? Father, help us. Father, help us. We pray for the nation of Israel. God, protect them. Help us, Father, to win people to Christ. Lord, we give you all the honor and glory. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Please stand with us as we close. my heart away.
Lord Jesus, I, I just pray that that is our prayer every day, to be more like you and to change our hearts to be more in your image. Lord, we just thank you so much for a, uh, a great sermon, a great day that we've been here uh, worshiping you. Lord, I pray that as we go forth, that we would just uh, live lives that would show you to all those around us. Help us to be bold in sharing your uh, gospel with others and sharing our faith. And uh, Lord, we know that, uh, that your return, you're calling us to, uh, the rapture is, is coming uh, sooner than it's ever been, Lord, and we should be diligent about your work, the, the uh, command that you've given us to spread the gospel. Help us to do just that. And uh, Lord, we just thank you for, for those many young uh, souls that have uh, given their lives to you, and we pray that they would uh, continue to grow and reach others for you. Lord, what a, what a blessing it is. And uh, we know that, uh, that there is revival, uh, and just help us to be a part of that. Lord, we uh, again thank you and uh, love you and ask it all in your precious and holy name. Amen.